Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is about Frank Smythe's and Eric Shipton's summit attempt in 1933. It is setting the stage for the upcoming video comparing the zigzag and couloir routes, but Smythe's climb is fairly interesting, covering everything from the ice axe to a possible location of Urban's body to the UFOs Smythe saw hovering over the northeast shoulder. I'll go through the events of the climb and some of what Smythe wrote about it afterwards, but this is more of a potpourri of information, and it helps if you are already familiar with the issues. I'll first go over the route he climbed, but it should be noted that Smythe descended a slightly different route, and most of his observations about what the best route to take came on his descent path. On June 1st, 1933, Frank Smythe and Eric Shipton started out from High Camp, which was Camp 6 on that expedition. They had reached Camp 6 two days earlier, but had delayed the summit attempt by one day due to bad weather, notably reporting a blizzard in the afternoon. For their summit push, their initial plan was to leave at 5 a.m., but it was too cold and windy, so they waited until 7. In terms of the cold, Smythe had substantially similar clothing to Mallory. Smythe describes his clothing as a Shetland vest, a thick flannel shirt, a heavy camel hair sweater, six light Shetland pullovers, two pairs of long Shetland pants, and a pair of flannel trousers, and overall a silk-lined Grenfell windproof suit. Of interest are his gloves. He writes... Gloves are always a problem on Everest, and the ideal glove that is warm yet flexible and will adhere to rocks is still to be designed. In this instance, a pair of woolen fingerless gloves inside a pair of South African lambskin gloves, also fingerless, kept my hands moderately warm. Thus his clothing was substantially similar to Mallory and Irvin's, with the notable exception of not using the large woolen overmitts and going with exclusively fingerless gloves. The 1933 expedition report leaves out the bit about the lambskin gloves also being fingerless. The language between the 1933 expedition report and Frank Smythe's book, Camp 6, is identical except for the words, also fingerless. And it would be interesting to find out if Rutledge edited out that particular phrase. The 1933 expedition reported a temperature of 4 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 16 Celsius on May 29th at Camp 6 at 8 a.m., so the choice of fingerless gloves is a bit odd, and one might question how serious he was about actually being able to make the summit. In any case, Smythe and Shipton started from the 1933 high camp, and this is the view from that camp, so not surprisingly, they are going to head over to the couloir and attempt to climb out that small gully. The couloir itself is not visible in this photo. Leaving camp, they climb up a small snow gully, with Smythe riding. A shallow, snow-filled gully took us diagonally upwards and across the yellow band for the best part of 100 feet. There was no difficulty, but every minute or two we had to halt and lean on our ice axes, gasping for breaths. This route takes them up across what would later be called the Holzell slot, and it is not clear why anyone would think that both Shipton and Smythe somehow missed seeing Irving's body as they passed that location on the way up and on the way back down. From that location, the pair took a traverse to an area below the first step, lower than the one taken by Wynne Harris a few days earlier. At the area below the first step, Shipton decides to turn around, and Smythe proceeds alone, eventually reaching the couloir at 10 a.m. and proceeding upwards along a similar but slightly lower route than Norton, reaching approximately the same high point as Norton at 11 a.m. In 1924, when Norton turned around, it was 1 p.m., and Norton had been going since 6.40 a.m., covering an additional 700 vertical feet and 1,000 horizontal feet. For Norton, being generous, he could have made 200 vertical feet per hour, and, as he was 900 feet from the summit, there was no remote chance of making the summit as a reasonable hour. Thus, for Norton, turning around at 1 p.m. made perfect sense. But not so for Smythe. Smythe writes, At least 300 feet of difficult rocks, all deeply snow-covered, remained to be climbed before easier ground on the final pyramid was reached. Perhaps I could do another hour or two's work, but what was the use of it? I should only exhaust myself completely and not have the strength to, left to return. However, later Smythe says that the route was impossible under the conditions in 1933, with no explanation for where it became impossible, nor why. In addition, although he claims it was impossible in 1933, he also claims it would be climbable under other conditions without stating any way he would know this. It is possible, indeed probable, that wariness and altitude distorted my judgment, but there are two things I believe to be true. Firstly, that Norton's route is practicable, and that when the tiles, as he calls the slabs, are free of snow, they can be traversed without excessive difficulty to the subsidiary cool war, and this can be climbed on to the face of the final pyramid. Smythe goes on to say that the route is probably not climbable if there is heavy snow, but does not clarify whether the rather light amount of snow present when he climbed it was considered heavy snow. 
Smythe also had various other curious observations, noting that he started to hallucinate during his climb. He felt some kind of presence after Shipton turned around, and he felt that someone else was climbing with him. When he took a break and took out some mint cake, he broke off some and tried to hand it to his imaginary companion. Such stories are not that uncommon on Everest, and Peter Hobbler has some similar interesting stories in Impossible Victory. On the descent, Smythe also reports seeing some UFOs hovering above the northeast shoulder, which he initially labels as kite balloons. Thus, Smith's statements must be viewed with the realization that he was suffering from extreme exhaustion and altitude sickness. His total climb that day was only from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. before he turned around, and he was back in high camp by 12.30 p.m. About an hour after he got back, Shipton heads down the mountain via the Longland Traverse, where he again encounters an afternoon storm. Smythe, exhausted, decided to spend an additional night in Camp 6, but he is able to watch Shipton descend until he's out of view. The so-called storm comes up shortly after that. The afternoon storm blows over, and Smythe reports a clear sky and calm winds. Smythe descends the next day, also using the Longland Traverse. When Smythe turned around at 11 a.m., he still had plenty of time to push on. With five hours to go until a 4 p.m. turnaround, he needed a climb of 180 vertical feet per hour to make the summit. From this, it should be clear that the route did not defeat Smythe. It was the impossibility of climbing without oxygen at that altitude. He had spent an extra night at high camp, which also did not help. But from a practical matter, without extensive experience at altitude and proper acclimatization, getting much above 28,000 feet is difficult. Shipton and Smythe were both well acclimatized. When making earlier trips up to Camp 5 at 24,500, they were able to climb at 1,000 vertical feet per hour, which puts them on par with Odell's rather impressive climbing. Thus, it is unlikely that any British-era climber could have fared better than Smythe unless they used oxygen. On the descent from his high point, Smythe took a slightly different route and uses this information to build a series of inconsistent recommendations about how the mountain should be climbed. For instance, while descending, he traversed well below the first step and notes, I had now to make the choice between climbing up at least 100 feet and joining the ascending route or traversing directly to the camp. To ascend again at this stage was utterly distasteful. I was too tired and my legs were leaden. They would descend easily enough or traverse horizontally, but I doubt whether I could have dragged them uphill unless hard-pressed. And yet later, he recommends placing a camp at the first step, saying that the climbing the extra 100 feet back up to it would not be a problem. He also recommends traversing the cool water lower and climbing the snow gully out, as opposed to taking the higher rock route favored by Norton. But two days earlier, while climbing the snow gully up to Camp 6, he does the exact opposite and complains about the energy required to cut steps. He notes the snow was the most evil quality, and they opted to climb out of the snow gully and take a rock route to the west. He deals with that by saying that rather than climbing directly up the snow gully, one could take some unspecified rock route along the rocks at the side of it. Between Norton and Smythe, this gives three slightly different options to climb a couloir route. That is a route from the British high camps across the couloir to exit the small gully, a route that has never been climbed. Norton's proposed route is a high traverse along the rocks to avoid the snow. Smythe's proposed route is a slightly lower traverse to enter the small gully lower and thus have largely an ice route, or alternatively, climb the rocks next to the small gully. With modern crampons, the ice route would be easier, but with hobnail boots, the choice largely comes down to personal preference for climbing on either ice or rock. One curious item is that on the descent, Smythe passed below the location of the ice axe and notes the large, gently sloping expanse of snow, screes, and broken rock that would be the likely place Mallory and Irvin would have fallen to. Although this observation was just after having seen the UFOs and after he tried to give his imaginary friend some cake, it is also the area that I think Irvin's body would be, largely based on the same analysis that is directly below the ice axe location. The problem is that that area is typically covered in snow, and although there was an undocumented search allegedly done in 2019, photos of the mountain that year show that particular slope still had a good amount of snow. I'll get into how I intend to deal with that particular problem in an upcoming video. Smythe would end up returning to Everest two more times, but would never make it as far as this first attempt. He died in 1949 at age 48 from food poisoning, and it is shortly after that that Norton wrote his final assessment of the Kulwar route, again choosing the higher rock route over Smythe's lower snow traverse and showing that the best way to win an argument is to outlive your opponent. Both Norton and Smythe's recommendations for the full route both suffer from a grass-is-always-greener problem. 
Namely, they both recommended routes that they themselves did not actually climb. Norton recommending a high traverse along the top of the yellow band, the route climbed by Wynn Harris, but not by Norton himself, and Smythe recommends an ascent to a camp at first step on the ascent, a route he never climbed, as well as climbing up the small gully, also a route he never climbed. Ultimately, Norton and Smythe's arguments were all for naught, as no one has ever climbed any of their proposed routes. Any climb out of the couloir has taken a lower traverse, such as that of Phil Urschler, or both the lower traverse and lower exit from the couloir, such as Messner. So while Smythe's account provides some valuable insight into the effect of high altitude on the mind, his various hallucinations and conflicting recommendations greatly diminish the value of his assessment of a couloir route.